Well, it's an honor and a pleasure, David, to uh, uh, to give this laudatio for you. Um, David um, is the recipient of the Brouwer Medal of uh, that was supposed to be awarded last year, and as uh, Barry already said, uh, this is a triannual uh, tradition of the Royal Dutch uh, Mathematical Society, and I made a list here. Uh, of um, the laureates that have received this medal uh, over the past 50 years. So it started with uh, René Tom in topology. We see names like Harry Keston in probability theory, Jürgen Moser in analysis, Yuri Manin in number theory, Laszlo Lovas in discrete uh, mathematics, um, who uh, is the recipient of the Abel Prize this year, Wolfgang Hagbus, Michael Eisenman, Lucien Berger, Kim Plofker for the history of mathematics, Ken Ribbit uh, four years ago, and now David Aldous for his uh, phenomenal contributions to probability theory. Now the tradition is that uh, for each awarding of the um, Brouwer Medal, there's a nomination committee and the nomination committee for 2020 consisted of four people, uh, Remco van der Hofstadt from Eindhoven, Frank Redig, from Delft, Bert Swat from Amsterdam, and myself as chair. And we uh, had long and deep and very enjoyable discussions looking at, uh, you know, uh, at renowned candidates. And unanimously, we, we decided already more than a year ago to award the medal to, to David. And uh, it would have normally happened last year, but due to COVID, we had to postpone this. And, um, and I consider this a very joyful moment, David, to be able to say a few words about you. And here again, I uh, show the medal that is on, your, on its way to you with on the front um, the, um, the, the, the picture of, uh, of Brouwer and on the back, uh, your name here listed. Um, as the recipient of the 2020 medal. So let's hope that it, uh, you will hold it very soon. Um, I'd like to say uh, a, a few words about the work of uh, David. David is an emeritus professor in the statistics department of the University of California at, uh, at Berkeley. And he's been there for a long time, uh, 40 years already. Um, the work of David um, covers both pure and applied mathematics, and it is characterized by great originality combined with great depth and beauty and breadth. And for those of you who were able to participate in the network session earlier this afternoon, in which uh, Shankar Bamidi, who is a PhD student of David, uh, spoke about many things in the work of uh, of David, he, he, he said something very nice. He said, David doesn't work from the inside out. He starts with what might look like an outlier problem and then turns it into something beautiful and brings it right at the heart of, of probability theory. And from there moves on to see how, how this can be applied in a very broad setting. And that's very characteristic of the way David operates and reading his papers is an absolute uh, joy. Over the years, David has contributed a wealth of new concepts, which uh, each of them has had an enormous impact, uh, not only on probability theory itself, but also on uh, many other scientific fields where you see that gradually, gradually these beautiful ideas drip into other areas and turn out to be uh, immensely um, uh, fruitful. David has in this way initiated uh, several new areas of research, which have then gone on to be flourishing, uh, not only in his own hands, but also uh, being picked up by other researchers, which for whom he has been a great inspiration. And on top of that, uh, he has put effort into popularizing probability through different channels. And I would, urge you to go and look at his website, uh, um, Probability and the Real World, which is full of 
you know, nice cons, uh, comments, interesting comments, funny comments, and uh, and when you go over this website, you see that uh, that he's going all over the place in 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 the role that that probability can play in in um, in various parts of uh, of science. Really, really recommendable, and uh, you, you'll enjoy having a look at that. I'd like um, to mention uh, a few highlights of what David has done. I listed 10, I cannot go into detail for each 10 of them. And um, for those of you, again, who have been present at uh, Shankar Bamidi's presentation, he spoke about three of them in, uh, in detail. Um, David was um, involved in, um, in studying protocols uh, and algorithms for, for networks. And there is his uh, work on the ALOA uh, protocol, which he showed was not quite functioning the way it should. And, uh, and that led actually people to, 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 uh, to change the protocol and it's being used in, in, um, in, in communication networks. He went on to analyze uh, the, the performance of combinatorial optimization algorithms using probability theory. And there again, he made marks on um, on how we should think about uh, these algorithms and how we should think about their optimal performance. Uh, David linked uh, two new concepts, uh, one coming from stochastic processes and one coming from weak convergence by uh, introducing what is now known as the oldest tightness criterion. This provides a connection between, on the one hand, stopping time, so these are times where when you observe a process, you can say now something happens and I'm, uh, the, the, and, and I'm stopping time and whether the process uh, is, is sort of well behaved. And, and again, this turned out to be a very important tool. He, together with Percy Diaconis, introduced uh, the phenomenon of cutoff in mixing times for, for marker processes. This is a remarkable phenomenon where you have a process that is on its way to equilibrium and for a long time, nothing happens. And then suddenly it's converging to equilibrium in a rather short time interval. And this is, this is remarkable. And it has also been uh, the start of, of many deep um, mathematical investigations into this phenomenon. Up to today, it's a very active area. David wrote a landmark series uh, of papers on limits of tree-like structures, which led him to, to introduce a concept called the continuum random tree. And this object, and here's a picture of such an object uh, in, you know, before you pass to the limit, that uh, th this object turns out to be uh, a, a way to understand universality in lots of different systems. It turns out that many different systems coming from perhaps population genetics or interacting particle systems or you know, complex networks, they seem in, in a limit to have a continuum random tree structure. And he put down uh, this object uh, and analyzed it and then showed uh, its beautiful properties. There's the famous Aldous Hoover theorem, uh, which is a notion of exchangeability of random arrays and this leads to, a, to an enormous extension of the well-known Definetti's uh, theorem. And this has become a major tool in different areas in probability theory, including random graph theory. David introduced the concept of local weak convergence, also something that uh, Shankar Bamidi spoke about, uh, which is the proper way of thinking about uh, convergence when you pass to, uh, to limits of large random graphs. And uh, what is it that you should be looking for in order to establish convergence? He wrote a book about what is called the Poisson clumping heuristic. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a unifying notion to describe rare events. And uh, again, this, uh, this leads to a much better understanding of the universality of all sorts of rare events that happens. And it has a remarkable range of applications. And, and he listed many of them to, to show the red thread through, uh, through all of this. David spoke, uh, David worked on uh, critical clusters in, uh, in the Erdős Rainy random graph. So what happens in the Erdős-Rainy random graph, when it's about to cluster and, and form 
um, a, what we call a giant component, and he gave a, a very beautiful description of, um, of this um, uh, phenomenon. And, and as a last category, I listed a number of uh, topics, which I called miscellany, which are also topics that he has worked on uh, relating to, to networks and uh, the, uh, recursive equations and stochastic models for phylogenetic, phylogenetic trees. And here's my picture of a critical erdos rainy random graph. So when you start to throw in more and more edges, the vertices are all arranged on the, uh, on, on the boundary, on a circle. Then you will see that there's a moment when uh, most of the vertices start to coalesce together and be connected. And that very particular moment, there is a beautiful structure. And David uh, unveiled this by uh, describing this in, in terms of something that is called the multiplicative uh, coalescent. Uh, <clears throat> uh, David was honored in, um, in his career with a number of uh, prizes, an early prize is the Dave, Roller Davidson Prize, um, which he got uh, almost, well, more than 40 years ago. He got the International Web International Prize in Probability Theory, which is for somewhat more um, uh, developed uh, researchers. He's a fellow and a member of uh, um, you know, several uh, statistical, uh, several um, um, scientific societies and the American uh, Academy of Arts and Science and the National Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. And now it is a great pleasure and honor um, that he has, um, received the Brouwer Medal. So congrat congratulations, David. And um, as a probabilist, I can say thank you for giving me so many, you know, I would say years of joy looking at your papers and, uh, and the rare occasions that I had to actually talk with you uh, were also um, were, were beautiful and uh, very inspiring. So thank you very much for that. And um, I would like to um, give you the floor to, um, for your presentation. Uh, okay, uh, uh, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, it's obviously a great uh, honor and uh, privilege to be associated with these uh, great names from the past. So uh, thank you. And uh, let me get on to my talk here. I'm probably the only person who has here who has not given a Zoom talk before because I'm retired. So we'll uh, see how this goes. Yes, let's find the talk. Where's the talk here? Here's the talk. Okay, can we yes, see we'll the see. slide? Yep. Very clear. Okay, so. Uh, yes, I, I've done a lot of. Uh, see, hopefully serious uh, math research. In recent years, uh, as briefly mentioned by, by Frank, I've gotten interested in you know, what does probability really say about the real world? Now, we all have different ideas of what the real world is, of course. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, in everyday life, when we talk about things being likely or unlikely, that those are sort of crude measures of probability, uh, what do we talk about? So somewhere else, I won't show it, somewhere else I actually have a file of 100,000 queries made to a search engine involving the phrases chance of or probability of. So we actually know what, in a sense, what ordinary people think about this, and it's nothing to do with anything we teach in probability courses. That's a, a teaser. You can find that on my uh, website somewhere. But basically, in everyday life, we think about chances in terms of future events in the, re in the real world, things that may or may not ha happen. As we all know, there are a few contexts where we have a lot of data and reasonable models, uh, even for things we think are uh, uncertain. So finance and sports are the natural uh, examples here. We don't know who's going to win a football game in the future. We don't know what the stock market's going to do. We, we recognize those as random, but we can actually estimate probabilities uh, for these things. Uh, once you get away from kind of structured things like finance and, and, and sports, when you get to unique future events, 
we just don't have any algorithm, any math for uh, kind of justifying probabilities. But nevertheless, we can think, we can guess, estimate, whatever word we want to, to, to use for perceived probabilities. So I'm going to briefly show and come back what I mean by the real world. So these are real world questions. I'm going to talk about this prediction tournament for later. But basically, we're asking whether a particular event, kind of a international politics uh, here, is my choice, whether or not this will happen before a deadline. So our, the deadline is kind of arbitrary, 1st of October. Will Boris Johnson, for some reason, cease to be prime minister? Uh, the bottom is, will Russia conduct a test flight of a new ICBM, a new missile? Will Saudi Arabia recognize the state of Israel, etc. So these are sort of ge geopolitics. So ultimately, they're yes, no questions. These will either happen or not by the deadline. But this is a, a, a game. We'll come back to this. It's, it's a game. And it's important that you are not asked to say yes or no. You're asked to write a numerical probability. Yeah. So the, the, these are things. Now, there's no rule for doing this. It's a human. This is all human judgment. Uh, and the question is, you know, do, does math say anything about this? Math doesn't tell us how to answer these questions, but perhaps curiously, it does tell us something about it. So that's my uh, issue here. Is there any mathematics relevant to these things? And of course, the answer is sort of yes. Uh, so I'm going to spend the first half of the talk just on one you know, basic example. I should say everything here is mathematically extremely elementary. You know, people say that at the beginning of talks and usually it's not true. You find out there are bits you don't understand, but uh, this really is ultimately high school algebra and the basic setup of uh, uh, probability. So, 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 so the, the, the math itself isn't interesting, but it, it's a, this is a conceptual issue of going from these vague questions to actually setting up ultimately toy models there's a draft paper on my uh, website, which uh, will say more. This relates a little to the philosophy of probability, which deserves one and only one slide here. So the next in international football match that the Netherlands team is going to play, June the 13th against uh, Ukraine, what's the chance that Netherlands wins that? Well, you could, you could make a guess, I could make a guess. I could say they have a 60% chance of uh, winning. My students from the Ukraine might say, oh, no, no, Ukraine's going to win. You know, the Netherlands only have a 20% chance of winning. So most of us would say that <laughs> these are all guesses and there's no such thing as a true probability there. That's a first, but the second thing is we imagine gamblers in general who are betting on things like football matches to decide which team to bet on. And again, these are given odds. These are not bets where you win or lose the same amount. So the, 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 the amount you might win and lose is a sort of perceived, uh, perceived chance of, of winning. But anyway, you, you, you ask which way to bet you think it gives you an advantage. And common sense says that you know, this is a skill like any other skill, and people who are better at doing this, people who are better at assessing probabilities, will, will, will do better than people who aren't as good at assessing probabilities. So the point is, both these assertions are seem very plausible, but of course they're contradictory. You know, either you sort of believe that these things have true probabilities, or, or, or you don't, and we're all a little inconsistent in, in this way. So. I'm adopting what I'll call the naive philosophy, which is that future events like football games uh, have some true probability, but we just don't know what it is. So, so, and I will say later, I'm not going to talk about real data, but I was going to mention you know, that there is data that's consistent with and e easily interpretable under this naive philosophy. <laughs> People who deal with the philosophy of probability have a range of opinions on it. You can be a dogmatic uh, frequentist and say that you know, probability only makes sense for repeatable events. If it's not repeatable, it doesn't make sense. You can be a dogmatic Bayesian who says there's no such thing as true probabilities for these things. It's all just opinions. And you know, it's not, data can't actually 
repute philosophy, but as I said, the, the, the data is very hard to interpret uh, under either of those philosophies. <coughs> so this first half is one example. There are, there are two different stories which we'll see are mathematically the, the same. The first one, this prediction tournament, I talk about because we have a lot of data on this, um, which itself is interesting. On the other hand, reformulating it as a bet is useful for extensions, because there are various things that we can think of as uh, generalizations of, of bets. Uh, yeah, so, so, so the, the, this is sort of more nice for mathematical development. <coughs> okay, so I'm going back to the slide I showed before. So prediction tournament, you're thinking about probabilities of future events. And there could be any sorts of events. I mean, you could do this with sports or, or arts or who, who's going to win a prize, who's going to win the Oscars, et cetera, but uh, I'm doing geopolitics. Uh, and as I said, the name of the game, the nature of the game is, is to you know, state a numerical probability for something happening before a deadline. So let's actually do this. <coughs> and I chose an example, you'll, you'll see, I didn't show, choose this example at random. When will a new Dutch government be, become effective here? <laughs> and in particular for, for, for a deadline here. So the deadline is 17th of June. <clears throat> the name of the game is to write down and submit the, your assessment of the probability. So if I had a live audience, we could do a show of hands. I'm not gonna <laughs> try it here. You see what other people have done. I'm going to scroll down here a little. So these are real people and the screen names. The, 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 the chance of before 17th of June, you assess this person says 0%, this person says 20%, this person says 35%, this person says 55%. Because what makes it interesting <coughs> is that there are these different opinions. This would all be a very boring game if everyone had the same opinion, but it's like any sort of gambling situation, it only works because people have different perceptions of the probability. Uh, you can take this more seriously or not. So you're encouraged to write down your reasons for, for, for this. So those of you who've been following politics sort of know what's been going on recently for this particular question. Uh, leaving pieces of paper around, which you, you shouldn't have. So, so, so uh, here's a person who's, you know, the, the recent events have made them change their opinion. And here's someone, 87%, also recent, who hasn't changed their opinion. Anyway, so, so this is what's going on. And I'll make a move in this game. I'm just going to change my previous assessment arbitrarily. I'm not thinking about this very seriously. So 55% I've submitted is going to tell me at some point, yada, yada, yada. So again, I, I made a move in a game. It's, you know, it's like a, a game of chess or something. Uh, you, you can argue that, well, this is, you know, a game isn't real world things. And again, that's a semantic question. I'm sure the Netherlands football team would think that you know, football was part of the real world. Uh, the other thing to say is that you you get a you get information both about in, what individuals do and what the uh, uh, average is. So the average forecast currently is sixty seven uh, percent, and you, you can you can use that. The other interesting thing about this is that it's different from an examination. It's different from most individual sports where you have to do things by yourself. Here you can literally do anything you like. There are no limits on how you can choose what to answer. So you can, you can copy other people. You could just always go with the consensus forecast. Again, that would be boring. Uh, you can, and people do, look for other people who've given good reasons and follow someone who's given a rational reason for the number and just copy them. You're entirely, you're entirely allowed to copy them. And if I go back to my uh, slide here, what was the last one? Well, will Russia conduct an ICBM? You know, if you happen to be a personal friend of Vladimir Putin, you're entirely allowed to call him up on the phone and ask him. 
So there are no limits on how you do this. Okay, let's move on just a second. It's not, ah, uh, what am I doing here? So we are screen sharing. There we go. Okay, so we want to score the, 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 this game. And of course, the way to score is quite straightforward to a mathematician. We score by mean squared error. So if I predict a 70% chance, I'm predicting 0 0.7. Ultimately, the event happens or doesn't. Ultimately, it's 1 or 0. So we have a squared error, or we have an error. Our error is 0.3 if the event happens. So squared is 0.9. If the event doesn't happen, my error is 0.7. My squared error is 0 0.49. So, so if I predict 70%, then again, ultimately, I get one of these numbers as my score. I'm doing this for a whole bunch of different questions. We just add up the scores. And the analogy to keep in mind, the good analogy is golf for several reasons. Firstly, in most games, you want a high score, but in golf, in this game, you want a low score. The score is error. Also, the word for tournament has different meanings, but this is like golf, but there's no actual physical interaction. You know, football, other games have interaction between the teams. Golf, everyone's doing the same thing, but they're just doing it themselves. So again, uh, here, it's a game, just like in a golf tournament, everyone does the, the same holes. Here, everyone does the same questions. Uh, it's not uh, an a elimination tournament as in tennis, where you just go through to the next round. <coughs> OK. <coughs> Here's our first bit of very elementary mathematics. And now we have to sort of pay a little attention to the concepts. Uh, when you do this, you get a tournament score, which is a number. So your tournament score is a number at the end of the game. What does the number depend on? So your actual num number depends on these numbers you predicted. You went to the website and typed in your prediction. So it, your actual score depends on the numbers and the event outcomes in a deterministic way. We're just adding up a bunch of numbers. On the other hand, under our naive philosophy, there are unknown true probabilities, PI, for the events. And now the expectation of your score now depends on your predictions, QI, and the PIs. So your expectation doesn't depend on what actually happened, because the expectation is this sort of theoretical uh, thing. You know, the expectation of a roll of a dice is 3.5, period. That doesn't depend on how the dice came up. And now a short calculation, a line of algebra, shows we can write the expectation in one term, which many of you who remember freshman probability will recognize as the variance of a uh, indicator random variable plus this other term. And the interesting thing is this other term depends on sigma squared. You predicted some numbers qi which are written down. We have these invisible numbers pi, the true probabilities we don't know, but they're there. There's some mean squared error, I've averaged the n squares. There's some mean er squared error between the known QIs and the PIs. That's this formula. We, don't, we have no idea what sigma squared is. We don't know the PIs, but we know this. And so I can compare two people, A and B, and I can subtract this. And lo and behold, this term goes away. So what we have here, and now we have to wave my hands over a kind of law of large numbers idea. In, in the long run, our actual score will be close to its expectation. So the difference in our actual scores, which we do know, uh, averaged, so the sort of uh, average of the difference of the scores over all the questions is exactly the difference between our sigma squared. It's exactly the difference between our errors in assessing the true probabilities. So we can tell who's doing better without knowing the true probabilities. Now that's the key thing here. So this is elementary thing. I and. What's funny is I do mathematical probability. I talk to people. I came across this literature uh, 15 years ago. I say, isn't this wonderful? And I've never talked to any mathematician who knew this fact. <laughs> it ought to be a sort of a very uh, basic uh, elementary textbook fact. It's known in the, the psych people who do psychology of probability have known this for a long time. It's, again, it's a, a line of algebra. Uh, but somehow, it, to, to me, it's a remarkable, uh, remarkable fact. Uh, the 
talk that Shankar gave this afternoon mentioned that you know I was one of you know a handful one of you know, five people around in the late 70s sort of came across this idea let's think about mixing times for Markov chains and you think it's weird you know that no one has thought about this systematically before so, so somehow uh, to me it's now weird that uh, people know this in some areas that there's the general theme of actions under unknown probabilities, there, there are various sorts of very technical uh, work on it, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but just this sort of uh, elementary idea that one can do something with, uh, with people's with analyzing how good people are at estimating these unique events. Now, the, the, the sort of background, the recent background here, you probably all heard of DARPA, the people who brought you the internet and self-driving cars uh, and things. Uh, the, the D in DARPA is uh, Defense, uh, Advanced Research Projects Administration, sort of government-sponsored work. It has a lesser-known cousin, uh, IARPA, I for Intelligence. Uh, they spent many millions of dollars uh, getting academics to run very carefully controlled tournaments of this type as experiments, as kind of psychology experiments. I participated in them. I wasn't running it. I was a, a game. Uh, and unsurprisingly to me, some people are better at this than others. Uh, much more than can be attributable by, by, by chance. Uh, this is, shouldn't be surprising. It's like saying that some people are better at golf than others. Nobody's surprised at that. Saying that some people are better at assessing unknown true probabilities now gets you back to the uh, uh, philosophy. There are quite a number of otherwise sensible people who say this is nonsense. You say this, there aren't true probabilities, so this is meaningless, and they're, they're sort of uh, not willing to kind of. Uh, believe in the natural interpretation of this data. We, in golf, we have no trouble saying that getting a lower score in golf is equivalent to being better at golf, but somehow people object to the idea that getting a better score than someone else in this tournament means you're actually better at assessing probabilities. This is strange, but true. Again, I slid over the a sort of long run thing because of course there's chance variation in terms of whether these events occur. And of course, trying to analyze non-asymptotics kind of is much harder because it depends on what the unknown true probabilities are. But under very under plausible things, if I compare people with different root mean squared errors in estimating yeah, probability, this whole racial system in the U.S., where white people were deemed capable and competent and credible witnesses in all court proceedings. But people I'm getting, of color were not. They were limited I'm in their ability from, uh, historically to testify on the basis of, of race. So and I'm, I'm getting some background from somebody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. somebody or should switch off his uh, microphone. On the basis um, of race. You can see this continuing in. Okay. Richard, I'm, so I'm sorry, David. Richard. Okay. I can talk very loudly, or can, <laughs> can somebody mute everybody? Okay, it seems okay. to have stopped. Yeah. Okay, that's right. good. Yeah. So uh, if my typical error is 10% uh, and your typical error is 15%, then that 5% difference in typical error is this sort of lower diagonal. Over 100 questions, I have a 75% you know, chance of getting a better score, but you, you might just be lucky. You can still w w win because it depends on the outcomes. Whereas in the next diagonal, if my typical error in assessing a probability is 10% less than yours, then sort of nine times out of 10, I'm going to do better. So this is just the sort of short-term, actical, uh, the, 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 the sort of short-term effect of pure, pure luck. And again, the, the, the data has shown that the difference in scores across hundreds of people is much larger than can be attributed to pure chance, the luck of the outcomes. Okay, so I moved on to the second equivalent version of this, which I call sort of a gentleman's bet, or uh, 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 ladies would count to here. So this is just a sort of casual old timey bet. We have a difference of agreement somehow. I think 
you, you think a future event has probability 20%, your friend thinks it has probability 30%. The fact that those are different means you can do a bet which each of you perceives as favorable. So you, you, you bet at odds which would be fair if the true chance was 25%. So with some numbers, the agreement would be that you pay your friend $15, 15 euros if the event did happen and your friend would pay you 5%, $5 if the event did not happen. And again, each person under their own opinion says this is a favorable bet. So doing the math here, and I'm gonna show another example of this here, but the, the math works nicely if we think of this a little like a stock market and you're buying or selling a contract. So a, a contract is like a, a share in a company it entitles you to, it's a piece of paper that entitles you to something. So a contract pays $1, say if the event occurs and zero if not. So the bet I set up up here is equivalent to saying that you're selling 20 contracts to your friend at price 25 cents. The price is this sort of, the, 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 the device is the sort of a percentage that would make the probability that makes this a, a fair bet selling your 20 contracts to your friend, your friend would give you 20 times 25 cents, $5 up front. You, you, you give your friend a piece of paper that says this is worth $1 if it happens. If the event doesn't happen, you, you keep the $5. If it, the event does happen, you have to give your friend $20, meaning you've given him $15 of your own money and his own $5 back. So it's just one way of saying that. I don't have another gentleman to bet with. We could maybe do this live uh, here, but we can bet with a prediction market. So let me go to, uh, keep on forgetting what I'm doing here. Uh, what do I have to do? I have to escape here. Okay. Another question, who will be Chancellor of Germany at the end of this year? We have various uh, possibilities here, uh, but let's bet on, let's think about the favorite. Here we have the favorite, basically a 40 or 41% chance. So we can now think, what do we think the chance of this person being Chancellor is? I could do a show of hands, I, you know, if you think it's more than 40% or less than 40%, and let's say that you, the audience, think it's more than 40%. So we're gonna buy some shares. Now, again, I joke about uh, a book on game theory, uh, it has a whole bunch of hypothetical, suppose Alice and Bob are in a situation, but we're not in a suppose uh, situation here. This is a real person. Uh, I'm a real person, and I'm about to bet real money here. So we're about to bet real money. So there you are. I'm going to buy buy ten shares, and I can just do uh, do this. Actually, except I can't because only one share is on uh, offer here. So let me avoid conversation. And get get one share. So I've now done that. Saying submit. Uh, we'll be notified when it's done, but uh, it's actually been done because I've moved this rather thinly traded market by, by buying what one share. So th this isn't entirely serious as a stock market, but it's still real. Uh, and okay, what am I? What's my? I have a speech here which I've uh, forgotten. Uh, yeah, okay, so it's just the idea of uh, a, a, a contract, you know, at the end of the year, these are for long-term bets, you're not going to know it, or, or, or what happens. At the end of the year, I'm either going to have lost my 41 cents, or, or, or I'm getting back a, a, a dollar from, from the exchange here, minus some transaction costs. Uh, so yeah, so, so the, the, this is sort of mathematically equivalent to the gentleman's bet where I, I have my, uh, where the prediction market price is just acting as my, my counterparty, acting as a person I'm betting against, and I'm going to win or lose here. Okay, let me get back to my slides. Uh, so to do the analysis of the Bet, I have to have a very specific 
protocol of uh, how I'm going to bet. So the story here is that we have a sequence of you know, future events, which are arbitrary. You know, I, I chose one event, so that there are many hundreds of events I could have bet my real money on. Uh, in terms of the gentleman, we have our own uh, perceptions of the probability of this event. And if they're different, we can then say we're going to bet at the odds corresponding to the average probability. Uh, but then our specific thing is that the, the size of bet as measured in number of contracts. And again, you think of a contract in poker terms, it's like we're both putting down money on the table and uh, the winner is going to get that amount of money, but we may be putting down different amounts of money on the table. So the number of contracts isn't the amount I bet, it's the sort of amount at stake here. And we're going to say that and it's fairly common sense and partly justifiable uh, on some other grounds that the amount we bet is proportional to the difference in our perceived probabilities or just proportional to your our sort of perceived uh, expectation of our gain here. So there's some constant of proportionality to go from you know, probabilities to dollars or, or euros, but that's sort of unimportant here. So now, uh -oh, let me go back here. Uh, so now the claim is that this is actually mathematically the same as our prediction tournament. That is, if we have these two people and at the same time and for the same events, they're doing a prediction tournament for points and they're also doing this bet for money, then in any particular case, you know, there are only two, two things, either the event happens or, or it doesn't happen. And in either case, we can look at the money that, that A wins from B, positive or negative, and we can look at the difference in their scores in the prediction tournament setting, and those two things are just the same. We've, we've designed our bet to make them uh, the, the, the same here, regardless of what happens. So they're sort of deterministically equivalent uh, things, but under this specific idea of the amount you, you bet is proportional to uh, your, your, your perceived advantage uh, here. So the point is our result for prediction tournaments translates to the gambling context uh, that in a sequence of bets between the same two people, the sort of average profit that A makes from B per game, it just depends on the, the difference in these root mean squared errors of assessing the true probabilities and again, we will never know or care what the true probabilities are. This just says that the person who's better at estimating them will do, do better. Now, of course, okay, this is hypothetical. I've invented that people A and B, but in fact, it's not hypothetical in the sense that B can be the prediction market price. And one could, you know, I haven't done this, but an actual feasible experiment you could try yourself with real money is to do this protocol. You, you can sort of find some prediction market things you can bet money on, you can uh, assess your own probability, you can do this protocol for how much you bet being proportional to the, the difference between these numbers. And in the long run, the, the, your, to, to the extent to which you gain or lose money in the long run with some adjustment for costs will, will tell you sort of precisely how much better or worse you are than uh, how much better are you, 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 or worse you are at judging these probabilities than the consensus of the market is. And again, this, uh, that to me is a sort of remarkable fact. I mean, it's certainly true to vague, there's this vague level we started off with, that for a gambler, in any context, the gambler who's more accurate at knowing probabilities will benefit, but the fact that there's this rather precise connection is a bit surprising here. So that's my part one, at some point I should check my time, which as usual I don't have much less, uh, but at least in these, this particular context, one can, one can estimate people's relative abilities with estimating probabilities. On the other hand, these are extremely special things. So, okay, this is an interesting thing. It's like the Pythagorean theorem is useful if you happen to have a right angle triangle in front of you, but is it actually any more significant than that? Uh, so the question is, let's go on to this more general idea. You know, any sort of decision theory is, uh, utility theory 
different actions, give you different payoffs, anything like, any time you can put outcomes in the same units, whether it's money or utility, abstract things you could think of as a, a gambling game. So, so if we now think very generally decisions under uncertainty with payoffs, uh, your classical theory is fine. If you know probabilities, what happens if you don't know probabilities? And the, the, the bad news is that the special feature of part one, which is that true probabilities doesn't ma don't matter, unfortunately doesn't extend very far. <laughs> so if you look at what we've done in the draft paper, we, we think of five, uh, we have five little toy models. Almost all of these are sort of mathematically elementary to, to analyze. I'm actually going to, uh, I'll talk in my remaining times of two of the ones that are sort of, uh, not quite so elementary. Uh, anyway, so let me just go on to the, that. We've given the cute, cute, cute names to the, the, these things. Uh, if you're doing an 18th century jewel where you're walking towards your department, your, your opponent, and you have one shot, then when do you make that shot? If you don't know, if you sort of knew your actual abilities, you'd know when to do it. But if you don't know your abilities, it's a harder uh, choice to do. Anyway, I encourage you to look at the paper. So, there's a general framework for, for this. So, so, so the kind of conceptual part of here, it's kind of like formalizing a notion of mixing times to Markov chains. We want to sort of formalize a notion in some elementary way. That, uh, so in a, a, a decision theory context, you have to make some action like whether or how much to bet and the outcome of the action, your gain or loss, that depends on whether an event of some true but unknown probability occurs. <laughs> We're in a situation where we sort of agree what the op optimal thing to do would be if we, knew, if we did know the true probability, but we don't know the true probability. So there are many things you could do in a situation like this, and we're going to think about the most naive one, which is you just act as if your perceived probability were the true probability. So that's a decision uh, that sort of specifies what you're going to do. But we now want to do a theoretical analysis of what happens when you do this under the model that your perceived probability is a true probability plus or minus a random error, where usually what we need to assume is that your, your error is unbiased, that you're not perpetually optimistic or pessimistic, but that your, your, your error has mean zero, again, over a lot of different uh problems of this type so everything is sort of ultimately long run this is a probability here but over a, 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 a large collection of different such problems <laughs> so, so and basically these toy models are just to show that this setting gives intuitively plausible uh qualitatively plausible uh, answers so this is a proof of uh, concept you know we have a you know, mixing time for Markov chains, we'd like to say it gives reasonable answers for shuffling cards. And it's nice to know that the answer you get by applying this theory to shuffling cards mathematically is, is sensible. <laughs> so a first slightly intricate example is the traditional bookmakers uh, uh, issue. That again, if you're the, 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 the old uh, bookmaker, where you're paying money at uh, uh, betting on a horse, winning or not winning a, a race, and the bookmaker is trying to make money from the spread that there are different odds, there are different, there are different sort of probabilities corresponding to a, a fair bet for the event happening or, or, or not happening. <laughs> so if you want to bet on the horse <coughs> winning, you have to pay 64. <coughs> if you want to bet on the <coughs> horse losing, excuse me, <coughs> Then again, saying this in the contract uh, terms, you, you, you can buy a contract at 64, or you can sell it at 60, and uh, in an, and the, the bookmaker, like any retailer who buys and sells, the bookmaker in part is making money by buying at 60 and selling at 64. So the issue from the bookmaker's point of view is uh, uh, how to choose that interval to advertise that you'll take bets on. So uh, there are different ways of doing this. I mean, an actual realistic model would be insanely complicated. 
so I'm going to consider different unrealistic scenarios. So the first one is to imagine the bookmaker actually knows the true probability of the event. Again, can't happen. We don't. Nobody knows it. But let's just assume it as exercise. Uh, as in our examples, well, gambling is only interesting because people have different views on probabilities. So we'll say that the uh, set of potential uh, gamblers, uh, their different sort of opinions are uniform on some interval, which is centered on some value, uh, which is the kind of consensus amongst gamblers uh, value. The bookmaker has to choose the spread of contract prices. Our, from our general framework, we're thinking that each individual gambler who has different perceived probabilities a gambler whose perceived probability is bigger than the price will buy, will, will, will bet on the event happening and the amount, the number of contracts they'll buy is proportional to this excess. Conversely, a, an individual gambler who perceives the probability is lower than the lower one will sort of bet the other way, bet the event not, not happening, etc. And of course, the person whose probability is within this range won't bet e either way because they don't have any perceived uh, advantage. So the point is, given the, the, this context, you know, you, you have a the, the, the bookmaker's you know, mean gain per potential gambler is a function of all these things, and the bookmaker can just optimize over x one and x two, and these are quadratics. So ultimately, it's not difficult to uh, do the math here. And the answer is that this is the optimal spread interval. This is the mean gain to the bookmaker. And what happens is very intuitive. The bookmaker depends on the spread of gamblers' opinions. You know, the, the bookmaker wants things where, wants to choose events where people have different opinions on which horse is going to win the race. Uh, and it also depends on, we're, we're assuming unrealistically that the bookmaker knows the true probability. It also depends on how, how far the sort of average gambler's probability is uh, off, the difference between the mean perceived probability of gamblers and the true one. And it depends on both in uh, quadratic. The thing to remember, because people have strange ideas about how gambling works, is that we don't choose the offered bets centered on the true value or on what the gamblers think, but on some weighted average of the two. <laughs> and there's a rather dramatic thing. If you uh, remember part of this uh, title, you can sort of find an article here. There was a lot of betting on the uh, recent United States presidential uh, election. In the few weeks before the election, sort of the sort of all the sort of rational analysis of the chance of Trump winning. Well, firstly, there was a big spread there from about 10% to 40%. But anyone attempting to do whatever analysis or modeling that they liked said it was somewhere between 10 and 40%. Uh, gambling in America is sort of quasi legal. Uh, in Europe, you can basically gamble on anything. So rich people who wanted to bet large sums of money had to go offshore to Europe. Uh, there are enough people with a lot of money who believed Trump was going to win with a 70% chance. And the uh, odds makers, who were rational people who were going with the sort of 20 or 30% chance, were, were very happy to sell contracts to these people for you know 70 instead of the more rational price of 25. So we're talking of $100 million here uh, was actually a, a bet. So, so the, 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 the bookmakers in Europe were for gambling with their own money. They, they, they were pre prepared to lose a few tens of millions of dollars if Trump had won. But in fact, they, they uh, made a larger number of tens of millions of dollars from these sort of very sort of irrational, emotional betting here. But uh, yeah, so, so uh, book, book, of course, in an ideal world, uh, the, the, the bookmakers would get sort of the, have the same risk from an event happening or not happening, so they'd win, that they make a small gain every time. And but that's not the most efficient way for the bookmakers to make money. Yeah, 
if they believe that they're, they're better at uh, doing the odds than gamblers are, which there's a lot of evidence for, because if they weren't, they'd be out of business. Okay, I'm going to uh, Yeah, this is briefly saying a, a different mo mo model the other way around. So here we're thinking that gamblers on average know the true probabilities, but now it's the bookmaker who doesn't know the true probabilities and is making some random error with variance sigma squared. In this case, again, the bookmaker can also can uh, uh, optimize what spread interval they're going to choose. And again, we get this intuitive uh, qualitative behavior that the mean gain depends mostly on the spread of gamblers beliefs but it also d depends on uh, the again the the, 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 the variance the, 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 the variance of the error that the bookmakers making in assessing uh, 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 probabilities and you sort of want that to be small compared to the variance of the gamblers estimates and we get some explicit complicated uh, uh, function here. But again, it's the, the, the general theme. In a sense, we're sort of formalizing things that are kind of seem obvious that, that the, 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 the sizes of errors in perceived uh, probabilities that now both from both the bookmaker and the uh, gamblers, this is what affects uh, outcomes. So I'm running out of time. I'm just going to indicate the other mathematical uh, context here which is the famous Kelly criterion for betting on favorable bets. How much money do you bet on favorable bets? In the stock market context, where you're sort of growing money. So the stock market model is that you start off with one unit at the beginning of a year of a stock. At the end of the year, it's going to be worth a random amount, maybe more, maybe less than $1. But, it, but it, instead of Putting all your money in one stock, you put Fortune's QI in different <coughs> stocks. And so now, after one year, your initial fortune one has, gets multiplied by this weighted average. And this goes on independently in different years. And the point is, you're not spending your money, it's building up. So there's a M1 in the first year, M2, M3, you're multiplying those together. And of course, to understand the long run effect of multiplying random quantities, you take logs. And add them up. So the optimum choice of QIs is not explicitly not to maximize expectation of M. You want to maximize the expectation of log M. Uh, and so if you knew, if you were in a, a casino type game where you knew probabilities and which unrealistically were in your favor, you could just do this. Of course, in the real world, we don't know probabilities. So we're in an unknown probability setting. Let me, Go back here, and uh, I'm sorry. We're in unknown probability setting, but we can do our uh, our type of analysis in our general uh, framework. So, so, instead of thinking of stocks explicitly, I'm going to uh, do the sort of simplest example of the Kelly criterion, which is where you're betting at even odds. So you're betting to either win or lose the same amount of money. You know, you'd only want to do that if you believed the probability was bigger than a half. But, uh, and to do the little first order approximations and also to be realistic, we want to think of events of probability around a half, a half plus delta for small delta. And again, this is a classic thing that should be taught in every first course in probability, which is that as a function of delta and the portion of money you bet here, your long run growth rate is this little quadratic function of A. And if you knew what the delta was, so if you knew you had a 52% chance of winning a bet, then the optimal choice each time is to bet 4% of your money each time, and you get a certain long run growth rate out of that. Uh, so this is a elementary, but the point of our framework is that we can now go on to uh, analyze what happens uh, I, I, under a model that our sort of perceived advantage, 2%, uh, is really the true advantage, plus or minus 
uh, some error. There's, we don't know the probability. Uh, there's an error here. We can do an analysis. Okay, I'm saying it quickly. I, I'm making up very artificial things like our errors are, are normal. Uh, never bet any real money under any assumption of a normal uh, distribution. Some piece of useful advice here. Uh, by a calculation which is uh, involves nothing more sophisticated than an integration by parts, one can actually get a, a formula for the mean uh, growth rate of this bet if you do this naive strategy of pretending that your perceived probability was the true probability and betting how much you'd win there. And what happens, it turns out, is very close to uh, intuition. And basically, if your typical error of your perceived probabilities was 10%, uh, then whether or not you made make money here in the long run is whether the actual true probabilities are more than 10% above the 50% break-even point. So this is something you might very naively guess without doing a calculation, and it's not at all an exact formula. It's just sort of numerically roughly, roughly correct. Uh, but this actually ra raises what I call the first sophisticated question. So all the analysis we've done is very elementary. Uh, but the first question, which we sort of don't understand is to say the common sense suggests that if you're gambling and you don't know probabilities you should allow for that by being more conservative so, so that the, the pretending you do know the true probabilities just sounds too too risky so let's uh, be more conservative uh, the kelly setting gives you a way where we can study this but it doesn't work out the way it should. <laughs> so the, the, the more conservative thing doesn't seem to be true and we don't understand what's going on here. So this is something we're thinking about and just there are things here. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. I repeated our general framework, I'm emphasizing what we've analyzed is assume your perceived probability as a true one and continue, but uh, the, the, intuitively that's not what you should do. And should we do that? Okay, conclusion. I'm about to run out of, I've run over time. And this started as trying to find one, one lecture, as trying to write a lecture for my undergraduate course. I ran out of time before doing that. I haven't talked about technical literature. The relevant technical literature is on the topic of combining expert assessment, but it sort of needs a lot of assumptions to, uh, to work. It tends to be asymptotic. Uh, it's curious that this kind of elementary stuff, as far as I know, uh, hasn't been uh, discussed because I don't really know de uh, decision theory. So it could be that someone's going to tell me that people thought about this 50 years ago, which that they could have. So I don't know. So in that sense, uh, comments are welcome. And OK, I'm going to stop now. Thank you all.